and my knowledge. So thank you so much for spending your time with me. Skin analysis is something that I feel sometimes students or estheticians, they um, want to skip that part. You know, you, you're in the groove, you're doing a nice facial, and you've had the client on your table or in your treatment room um, three, four, five times already. And so we kind of get, not lazy, but we just kind of get in the groove. So I want to give you some tools and, um, to be able to do that skin analysis and have fun with your client and make sure you're documenting the results. All right, so um, let's talk about skin. We know that skin is the largest organ of the body. We know that it's slightly acid pH, it's about a 4.5 to 5.5, around a five, right? And then on the pH scale, because seven is neutral and anything over eight and beyond is alkaline and the skin is happy in an acidic state. It's a fine texture, slightly moist and flexible. It is the protection from the environment. The skin is there to keep things out, all right? So we wanna make, be mindful of that. So um, we also need products to penetrate the skin. So if the skin is slightly waterproof, we need to look at what can we use in our toolbox to help water soluble substances penetrate the skin. In our skincare line, we have peptides, but in our treatment room, we can use ultrasound and galvanic. Those are two things we have at our fingertips that can really help products penetrate nicely. It's thinnest on the eyelids and thickest on the soles of the feet. And of course, it's 16% of our body weight. So when you have a look at the structure of the epidermis, you can see how plump and juicy those dead skin cells are. I always say on that epidermal dermal juncture is where we are making those melanocytes. And then of course, they're gonna start dividing and flat, flattening. There's our lucid and our light layer. Just so you know, in our spinosum layer is mostly where those um, Langerjan cells are, and those are the cells that protect our skin. And so that's why I like to use a lot of ingredients that will boost those cells and be able to protect our skin post-procedure. Post okay, so the layers of the skin, like I said, we have the basal layer and then the prickly cell layer, the granular layer, the clear layer, and then of course the horny layer the top layer of the skin. The basal layer, which is the deepest layer of the epidermis, its lower surface is attached to the dermis. Cells produce and move towards the epidermis and the melanocytes are formed in this layer. The dermis is a tough, dense connective tissue. I always like to say we're in the volume business because think about when you have a younger skin, when you're in your teens or even when you're a child, your skin is thick, plump, and juicy, right? And so as we get older, the cellular turnover starts to slow. So what we need to do is we need to ignite that collagen and elastin, that fibroblast activity, so that we can start a thickening of the skin and produce a nice and plump and juicy um, epidermis and dermis. The dermis is... 25 times thicker than the epidermis. And um, why that's good to note is, is that when we do micro wounding of the skin, we are triggering that dermis to produce collagen and elastin. And also you'll notice there are a lot of nerve endings there. So sometimes when we do perform certain services, certain medical aesthetic services, we may need to um, have a numbing agent or a cooling agent to make the client more comfortable or a fan. There are two layers of the dermis, the superficial papillary layer, and of course the deep reticular layer. Now we are doing most of our services on the epidermis, but it's important to note how the dermis affects the epidermis and vice versa. So the papillary dermis, the superficial papillary dermis, contains nerve endings, fine capillaries that bring oxygen and nourishment to the skin. Waste products are carried away. The deep reticular layer below the papillary layer is a tough elastic fibers responsible for elastic and skin tone, sweat glands, sebaceous glands, erector pillar muscles, fine veins and arteries. So you can see how thick that dermis is. You can see that the papillary dermis is attached to the epidermis and then that reticular dermis is underneath. The subcutaneous layer 
that I think I have a lot more of during the COVID-19 um, quarantine includes fat and connective tissue, aids in insulation, good source of energy, and contains capillary veins and nerves. The subcutaneous tissue is a fatty layer found below the dermis, also called the adipose or subcutis tissue, various in thickness, gives smoothness and body contour, protective cushion for the outer skin. So if we put that all together, we can see how we have that epidermis, then we have the dermis, and then we have our subcutaneous layer. What is our skin function? What is our skin actually doing? What I talked about before is it is a protective layer or a barrier from in the environment. It is a barrier from bacterial invasion. This is very important. We know now how important it is to, to wash our hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds and it's really to protect our skin from the invasion of bacteria and viruses. It keeps the, the skin supple and moist by sebum production. Melanin production protects the skin against ultraviolet light. And those Langerhans cells, remember I talked about that, those Langerhans cells that boost the immune system. The reflex action produced by the sensory nerve endings to prevent energy um, injury. And of course, it is waterproof. I like to talk about the functions of the skin. Sensation, right? We need to feel um, heat. We need to feel when we're hurt. We, need, we, we feel sensation, heat regulation, absorption of product, protection from the environment, excretion and secretion. And of course, vitamin D production. And they were talking about now, which is interesting to me, the importance about vitamin D and protecting ourselves and also boosting our immune system. This is something that I've always talked about. I call it precise dosage of light. Vitamin D is vital. I happen to have a vitamin D deficiency. So not only do I take vitamin D supplements, I make sure that I have direct sunlight on my skin at least 15 to 30 minutes every single day. Skin and the aging process. So there are two types of aging. We have our internal aging and we have our external aging, right? So internally we are aging. If you look at your mother, your grandmother, your sister, your aunt, your uncle, you'll probably see how you're going to age. That has to do with our genetic makeup. You know that when you see some of your clients maybe in their 60s and their 70s, not a wrinkle on their skin, and you may see somebody in their 30s with signs of aging. You know, our genetics determine how our skin is going to age. Of course, we have environmental and external factors. We know 80 to 90% of aging is the sun because it breaks down those collagen and elastin fibers in the skin. The UVB burn the skin, the UVA, penetrate through the skin and break those collagen and elastin fibers. If you think of a rubber band, those old fashioned rubber bands that we use um, at our desk, if you think about putting them in the sun, when I was young in South Africa, we would like make a big ball of those elastic bands. When you put an elastic band in the sun, it's gonna break. Think of that as your elastic fibers. Smoking asphyxiates the skin, our working environment, pollution, all of those external factors also affect how the skin ages. We start seeing signs of aging in our mid 20s. Some of those signs are fine lines and wrinkles, thin and transparent skin, loss of underlying fat, bones that shrink away from the skin due to bone loss, which causes sagging, dry skin that may itch, inability to sweat or sufficiently cool the skin, graying hair that eventually turns white, hair loss, unwanted hair. Gene con genes control how quickly the normal aging process unfolds. Some notice those gray hairs in their 20s and others do not see graying hairs until their 40s. This is a famous picture of a truck driver. So what you wanna be aware of, the importance of wearing sunscreen every single day 
365 days a year. I believe in non-chemical sunscreen of an SPF of at least 30 on the skin. I do not like using chemicals on the face because chemicals, of course, go into the body, but also the fact that it is a skin irritant. And also the chemicals that we use in our sunscreen are breaking down our environment as far as the coral in our sea. So a lot of places now by the beach are banning chemical sunscreens. And I think that that is a very good idea. So external and internal factors work synergistically with the natural aging process. Sun damage, gravity, sleeping positions, and smoking. Smoking asphyxiates the skin. Now you may have a client that works in a bar or works in a kitchen at a restaurant where there happens to be a lot of smoke or people smoking in the bar. They may not be able to change their work environment, their work, but a lot of antioxidant treatments that they in, in the salon or spa, as well as oxygen treatments and antioxidant treatments at home will really help them. So sun damage, gravity, because everything's going down, sleeping positions, why? Because muscle has a memory and smoking. So this gentleman was a truck driver and the side of his face that was exposed to the, to the sun going through the window, you could definitely see that his natural aging process was on the left, but on the right, that was the thickening of the skin from the sun. I won't live up to any expectations. What you see is what you get. And worse yet, I can't give an explanation for why it's gray on your side. Better yet, I'll give you an indication for why you're feeling deprived. Pride, pride, pride. We'll never let lack of an imagination keep us locked up inside, even when the sun has died. So we can see the importance of using sunscreen. That's a no-brainer, but that's 
something that really you should be retailing the most of. Everybody, regardless of the um, time of year, should be wearing sunscreen, 365 days a year. Okay, so a couple of other things. I feel the lady on the right-hand side, top corner, if I reach her age, I'm gonna be smoking a cigar. But if we can remember that um, not to smoke, um, the use of sunbeds, it's you know just as bad as going out in the sun. So the aging definitely will be sped up with the sunbed with the skin laxity, as well as skin cancer and premature aging. Sleeping, sleeping positions, and again, sleeping with makeup, all the dirt, debris, we want to make sure we've removed from the follicle and having a clean skin. It's really important. I want you to be talking to your clients right now because I think a lot of clients think, oh, well, you know, I'll wash my face once a day. Well, washing your face is kind of like washing your hands, right? We want to make sure that we are cleansing our face thoroughly morning and evening. And I teach my clients to cleanse their skin twice. Um, first cleanse, I say, sort of loosens up the makeup, dirt, and debris. And the second cleanse removes the rest of the makeup, dirt, and debris from the skin. So cleansing the skin thoroughly morning and evening is very, very important. The aging process is a complex process. There are cellular changes. There is collagen depletion, uh, free radical damage. Muscle movements, like I told you, muscle um, it has a memory. And so those animation leads to more pronounced wrinkles over time. Signs of facial aging in the 30s, the appearance of wrinkles and discoloration can be seen. Skin may be less radiant. In the 40s, collagen and elastin support network breaks down. And the skin can be drier and the lines and wrinkles appear more prominent. In the 50s, new cell production decreases. Skin retains less water, which increases wrinkle formation. So here, I really want you to think about, in, especially in the 40s and 50s, how important serums are. Right off the bat, I'm thinking of um, a hyaluronic acid serum because hyaluronic acid holds 1,000 times its weight in water. And when your skin is um, dehydrated, lacking moisture, that, that would be fantastic. And then as we also age, there may be more hyperpigmentation. So there, a serum there too with vitamin C and tyrosinase inhibitors and brightness are so important. So really be thinking about how maybe in the 20s, it's more of a maintenance skincare routine. And then your 30s, 40s, and 50s, we really are, are targeting the skin conditions. So disorders of the sudiferous gland would be anhydrosis, lack of perspiration, hyperhidrosis, over secretion of perspiration. And I know they're doing great work with Botox for people that have an over secretion of perspiration. Bromohydration, I can't speak today. Bromohydrosis, which is a foul smelling perspiration. And then malaria rubra, which is a prickly rash. So when we're talking about acne, we have grade one with your open and closed comedones with occasional pustules. So we de de definitely can extract our pustules and our comedones. Grade two, large amount of comedones with few papules and our pustule. Grade three, a large number of open and closed comedones and many papules and pustules. So when I have grades one through three, what I like to do is chemical peels when there's a lot of pustular activity because I don't want to break open the pustules with um, microdermabrasion or any type of um, sort of mechanical exfoliation where I can spread bacteria on the skin. So that's where I like to use chemical peels that will hold, will help dissolve the desmosomes and the glue that hold the cells together, coagulate the protein if I'm using a BHA um, chemical peel and make my extractions a lot more easier. Remember, I want to try and control those, that pustule activity. And of course, cystic acne, I would refer them to a um, dermatologist um, or a medical practitioner. And then also, I would definitely be using blue LED as well as, as my um, high frequency. Anything that I have and my oxygen treatments that will help with bacteria on the skin because we're trying to control inflammation the first indication of any disease is inflammation and then we're trying to control the bacteria on the surface of the skin acne scarring is a big problem that's why we want to try and control the acne when we first see it 
when I'm working with an acne client or patient, I like to see them every two weeks and I'm gonna customize my treatment um, uh, to be able to look at what different protocols are gonna be different each time, depending on what, how the client looks. But I definitely wanna be able to be doing my extractions and emptying out those follicles and keeping the skin clean and free of bacteria. Because I always say a, a, a health, an oily skin is a healthy skin, but we, the, the bacteria is a problem. Ice pick scars look like the skin has been jabbed with an ice pick. Acne pit scars, slightly sunken pimple or cyst that has been destroyed and the skin forms a scar tissue. Acne rays is a lumpy mass of raised tissue on the skin surface caused by cyst clumps together. So we wanna try and stop the scarring before they form. If there are acne scars, we have things in our toolbox. We have microdermabrasion, crystal, and of course, diamond. Plasma lift can work nicely on Fitzpatrick one and two, three with caution. Lasers, IPL, chemical peels. So we have quite a few tools in our toolbox. I never over promise. I take before and after pictures. I, I show them their skin um, and their photographs every time they come so that they can see the progress of the skin. Rosacea is a chronic inflammation, erythema, flushing present, pustules, cuprose or tangulatasias. Some people may have worsening rosacea than others. I have partial rosacea. So how I try and customize my skin treatment is what I try and do um, is no steam or steam further away cool towels instead of steam towels, red LED. So anything that can reduce redness in the skin for my at home, I'm looking at anti-inflammatory, counter irritant type ingredients like bisabolo, chamomile, licorice, mulberry, beer berry, green tea, anything that can reduce inflammation, ginger that can in, in, reduce inflammation in the tissue. And retinol is very good, by the way. Um, so I'm gonna use mild acid and retinol every other night. So this is a skin, digital skin analysis. If you can see how this really helps you analyze the skin. So on this, we are looking at this client here. She had wrinkles already. Um, wrinkles. She had, um, she had freckles. She had sort of freckles as a child, freckles as an adult. But the most interesting thing here is that she's got the bacteria on the skin. So really talking to your clients about um, not touching their face, washing their hands, cleansing their skin. This is where a good BHA toner comes in, a clarifying toner, cleansing the skin, using a toner, to get that bacteria off the face. And here we have another um, look at the skin. These digital skin analysis is looking at um, the client's skin um, with a group of people in their, a cohort in the same age group, right? So contagious disorders, we definitely wanna make sure that our client has an intact healthy epidermis. I cannot diagnose disorders, but I can recognize disorders. A couple of books that I recommend, of course, the American Association of Dermatology or the Dermatology Association in your country. I know that Dr. Pagrisis has a very good book on diseases and disorders. I know that Dr. Mark Lees has a good book as well. So there are resources out there so that you're able to recognize if your client has a wart on their face, has a, um, any type of fungus on their face, a ringworm, then that is a contraindication for the service, all right? Again, we're looking for an intact ep um, epidermis. If you see a disruption of the epidermis and you're not sure if this is a rash, a fungus, a contact dermatitis, an eczema, well, guess what? They're not a candidate for the service, all right? And herpes simplex can be spread to the nose and the eyes to you, and therefore 
your client might say, say to you, which I've heard, oh, it's not in the contagious stage. Well, you know, if there is a lesion on the face, that is a contraindication for the service. Full stop. Here are some lovely pictures of what you can see. There's ringworm on the right. I've seen warts on the faces. I've seen all kinds of things. So we need them to go see their medical doctor first. And so we need to make sure that it's cleared up before we can perform a service on them. We are gonna be wearing gloves from the beginning to the end of the service, changing our gloves during the service when necessary, washing our hands before and after the service. If we have to remove our gloves, washing our hands before we put new gloves on, um, 20 seconds with soap and water, sanitizing our hands during the service. Looking at skin cancer, we're looking at the A, B, C, Ds of skin cancer. A for asymmetry. So I like to say that if you see something on the skin that looks suspicious, a mole, for example, right? Then you, if it is it perfectly round, can you cut that? Let's pretend in our head. Can you divide that mole in half or that lead and, and fold it up? And does it, is it the same all sides? If the borders aren't even, maybe suspicious. Is the color, what is the color? Is it very dark? Is it very white? Is it very blue? Diameter, what is the size? And then is it evolving? So for example, you don't want to see something on the skin's back or face and say, oh my goodness, this looks like skin cancer and scare them to death, right? Is it evolving? And um, what you want to say to them is, I advise you to go get this checked out. I'll give you an example. I had like a skin tag where I would close my bra at the back of my back and it would rub against it, right? So I decided every year I get a full body check of the dermatologist. So I decided to go to the dermatologist and I decided to um, have it checked. So they looked at it and they looked at, they gave my whole body a scan and they said, well, no, that's, that's just a skin tag, but we're gonna remove it because it's, it's gonna rub against your, your bra strap and be irritating. But this on your stomach looks suspicious. I said, where, where on my stomach? Well, there was a tiny black dot. And I promise you, I haven't worn a bikini since 19, probably 79. Because, you know, I grew up in Australia, I grew up in South Africa, but in my teens, for those of you who don't know, I grew up in the Boy George era, which was the pale skin era, okay, and the Annie Lennox era. So I was not going in the sun as a teenager, right? But as a child, from when I, when I was three till about 10 years old living in Australia, I was out in the sun all the time. So I always say the sun is like a bad marriage, it never forgives and never forgets. So it you precancerous and cancerous lesions can come out later on in life. So it was a precancerous lesion and I had to have it removed and skin around it. So it's very if you see things on your client, it's a good idea to say, um, you know, I think this may be a good idea for you to go get this checked just as a precaution. So 80% of lifetime sun exposure occurs prior to age 18. 3% of childhood cancers are skin cancers. One death per hour from skin cancer in America. So what am I saying? I remember I said to you, I think that the sun is very important for vitamin D protection. So what I do, my personal thing, because I like to call it precise dosage of light. So I kind of do 15 minutes aside um, of direct sunlight, and then I put my sunscreen on to make sure that I'm protected and I don't have over sun and over sun damage and um, expose myself to skin cancer and premature aging because I don't want to get older than 52. All right, so we're looking at the A, B, C, D, and now E for evolving. Poor Barbie, I want you to remember, for those of you who know, Bob Marley had cancer on his toe. You know, I didn't wear shoes growing up, and so you have to make sure that you are looking everywhere, eyelids, scalp, behind the ear. When I do a skin analysis, I check behind the ears because I could see com um, comedones behind the ears. Or, or, um, but these are places under the nail, the mouth, the groin, between the toes, the buttocks. So, you know, sneaky places where cancer can hide, 
not just on the visible areas of the body. So when we're doing skin analysis, we are recognizing the characteristics of skin disorders. We are not diagnosing. Skin type is what you're born with. Skin condition is what you end up with. So let me give you an example. I have a combination skin. This, I'm always going to have a combination skin. It was oilier in my teenage years in the T zone, right? So, but as I've gotten older and I'm maturing and my estrogen levels have dropped, right? It's allopidic, lacking oil and dehydrated, lacking moisture, but it's still a combination skin. So we're not going to diagnose a disease. We're not going to pull out hair from the moles. We're not going to um, say what we think they have. We're going to just decide whether they're a candidate for the service today, and we'll definitely be recognizing this, the um, skin conditions. Okay, so my 12 steps, what do I do? I turn on my mag lamp. I look at my skin. I touch, look, and feel the skin. I feel the skin in quadrants of the face meaning all areas. I ask my client, what would you like to change about your skin? I wanna really target my skincare treatment today on my client's concerns as well as mine, but I want to make her happy. I ask her, what would you like to change about your skin? I listen to her concerns. I ask her, tell me about your home care routine. What do you do in the morning? And what are you doing in the evening? Why is this important? It's important because I may have a client that uses 16 products on her skin. I may have a client that likes a one, two, three, right? So I wanna listen, maybe my male clients like to just do the exfoliation or the cleansing in the shower. I wanna make sure I'm listening to what they're using, how they're using it, and when they're using it. And are they using the correct products for their skin type? And what can I slot in, for example, an exfoliation or a serum, all right? I'm gonna discuss what treatment I'm doing today. How am I customizing my treatment today? For example, I may see somebody that has a lot of diffuse redness on the skin. Maybe I'm gonna use no steam or cooler towels or use products geared to more of a rosacea type skin, a skin with redness, if that makes sense to you. We've gotta customize our treatments for our client's skin type, skin condition, and skincare concerns. I like to compliment my clients. Sometimes it's not easy to find, but it is important. I like to analyze the skin type, analyze and note the skin type and skin conditions. I'm checking for dehydration, sensitivity, and elasticity. Dehydration, you can gently press the skin together and see dehydrated lines. Sensitivity, you can see the flushing on the skin sometimes just by cleansing the skin. Elasticity, you can pinch the skin slightly and see if it springs back. You can explain to the client the skin treatment they will receive today. You will discuss the future skin treatments and suggest home care to enable your client to reach their skincare goals, right? I believe that 80% of great skincare happens between the treatments. So if you're doing a beautiful vitamin C facial, I want you to send your client home with a vitamin C serum. Sometimes it's not easy to find um, something on the skin that looks fabulous. So you can always say, nice eyebrows, right? Nice texture, nice tone. Think of something. Skin type, remember I touched on that? We talked about how the skin type is genetically determined. Dry skin does not produce enough oil. Normal skin, good water and oil balance. Combination skin, both oily and dry at the same time. Oily skin, excessive sebum production. Sensitive skin, skin reacts easily to products or the environment. I like to say sometimes the skin is sensitized through incorrect product use. It's amazing, once you get them on the correct cleanser and toner, how much the skin will improve because sometimes they've disrupted that acid mantle. So I want you to think about that. Having products that are pH balanced to the skin. Here's a nice example of dry skin. 
normal skin with a good oil and water balance. A combination skin, which is oilier in the T-zone. An oily skin, which you will see an open pore right to the jawline. Sensitive skin, you'll see red and flushing and it'll be hot to the, warm to the touch. Common skin disorders that you're gonna see underneath the magnifying lamp is acne, premature aging as a result of sun damage, dehydration, pigmentation disorders, comedones, milia, hyperkeratinization, which may be a thickening of the skin, a keratosis, cuparos, and sensitivities. Comedones or blackheads, milia or whiteheads, dehydration, sun damage, sorry about that, hyperpigmentation, erythema, keratinization or buildup of dead cells, keratosis, a rough texture in dead cells, cuparose, a redness or distended capillaries, wrinkles or lines, poor elasticity or sagging, hyperpigmentation or brown spots, hypopigmentation or white spots, irritation, redness and inflammation, rosacea, papules being raised lesions and pustules with pus present. So this is a nice chart as a guide. If we look in Eastern medicine, we'll look at, in reflexology, we will look at areas of the face and how they reflect what's going on inside the body. I always say what's going on inside the body is a reflection of um, a roadmap of what's going on in the skin, right? So the kind of the two work together. That's why I like to talk about being on an anti-inflammatory diet, being on an acne diet. I don't say that eating a cut cake causes acne, but Dr. Pericone has a fabulous acne diet. And also um, um, Dr. Dr. Wheel as well. I, you know, I like to look at a holistic approach and looking at the whole person, drinking a lot of water, detoxing the body and the, and the skin, a smoker, right? The lungs are on that cheek area. When you see a yellowing on the skin, it may be have to do something with the lungs. Now you're not gonna say, oh my goodness, you know, you have lung cancer, right? But you know, if somebody um, is on their cycle, you may see a breakout on the chin and lip area, for example. So those are things to think about. When you are using the skin scope, these are great. This is the black light. This will be very helpful to show you areas of dehydration and areas of excess oiliness. So we have some added tools in our treatment room, a skin scope, a skin scanner, and a digital skin scanner. A mag lamp is fantastic. That's still my first tool. And then if you have added either the digital skin scanner um, or just the skin scanner or skin scope, those are additional, which will show you hyperpigmentation, which will help you promote serums and as well as SPF and tyrosinase inhibitors and brightness on the skin, as well as seeing oiliness too. These are great tools to have at your disposal. So I like to have a complimentary skin analysis on my menu, a 15 minute skin analysis that clients can book with you for a one-on-one. -on -one. So with this wood lamp, you will see that the hyperpigmentation as well as dryness and thin skin. So what does affect the skin? Stress, free radicals, dehydration, vitamin deficiency, improper nutrition, alcohol, caffeine, sun, and improper skin care. When we're looking at the Fitzpatrick scale, the Fitzpatrick scale is something for you to be aware of. What happens when this skin is exposed to sun, where it's exposed to trauma, because when we look at laser, when we look at IPL, when we look at chemical peels, when we look at what I call more clinical aesthetics or medical aesthetics, what does that skin do when, do when it's traumatized? 
Is it gonna produce more melanocytes? Is it gonna be hypertrophic scarring? So that's why the Fitzpatrick scale is important. Now, Fitzpatrick one, we know is your Emma Stone, your Prince Harry, your Anne Hathaway, that pale skin, that freckle, the, you know, um, freckles on the skin, very light green eyes. Um, then of course we have type two, which of course is also a very fair skin that'll also burn easily. Type three could be a type four. Um, so I, what I like to do is not only do I look at the skin and I say to them, so how long do you stay in the sun before you burn? For example, for me, it's 15 minutes, right? And then I burn. I don't, I don't even get a tan. I go from, I, I get it, the best I'll get is like a honey color. So um, I burn very easily. I'm a type two. But I want you to ask more questions. If somebody to you looks like a three or a two or a one, fine. Okay, that's what you see. But now you ask a question. How long in the sun do you, can you say before you burn? Do you burn or do you just tan very easily? All right. Now also I want you to ask them, do you know your heritage? What part? For example, you from Italy, you get light skin detail and you get a darker tone. The same in the Middle East, the same in India, right? We are now a culture of many different cultures. So I'll give you another example, right? I have a lot of students from Brazil. Most of the time I would say they're a, a type four. Well, I had one Brazilian with a very fair skin. She looked to me like a type two, but I asked her, I said, you're from Brazil. Tell me about your heritage. She said that her grandfather was African-American. Well, she's a type four in my mind. She tans very easily. So, and if you're not sure, go ahead and classify them one darker so that you are very careful with your products and your ingredients. And of course, you're always gonna follow manufacturer guidelines and skincare product guidelines when you are working with your client's skin. I always say one foot on the gas and one foot on the brake, all right? So we, what does that mean? Well, do mild appeals more often. Take notes of what you see on the skin. Take before and after pictures. See what that skin can tolerate. That skin is gonna change as it ages, as it goes through different scenarios, different illnesses, different um, winter, fall, summer, um, different climates and different environments, right? We have to be careful. The Glogar Index is gonna tell you how the skin ages. Mild signs of aging, right up until where the skin probably wouldn't age anymore. There's no more wrinkles, it's wrinkles at rest. And again, you could have somebody in their 40s that may have a type one. You could have somebody in their 40s that may have a type four. So the, what this is doing is between, between your Fitzpatrick and your Glauga index and other indexes, we are just saying, how is the skin doing? What type of treatment protocol can I create? Because we cannot cookie cutter treatments. We cannot do one acne treatment on every single acne client that comes in the door. Your intake form is vital, the client history, the medical and lifestyle, the treatment documentation, the informed consent, the release form, the client expectations and concern, on concerns, short-term and long-term goals. We wanna make sure we do a thorough consultation and we discuss medications. Are they taking any internal medications? Are they taking any prescription topicals or allergies? Sometimes when they're on a prescription cream, when they're on a prescription Retin-A or retinoic acid, they think it's a moisturizer. They don't understand that it's an exfoliant and that it may be a contraindication and also allergies. Are they allergic to some enzymes or are they allergic to aspirin so we wouldn't use salicylic acid? It's very important to ask these questions. It's very important to ask them the AM and PM routine, any allergies to products or ingredients the last 12 months because allergies can change. We wanna be able to discuss a treatment plan and a program and get them on a series of treatments. We want to give them a product prescription, right? There's nothing in the pharmacy 
that I want them to use. I want them to use professional products. I'll give you two examples. When I go to my hairdresser, I color treat my hair. I only use the hair products, the, the um, shampoo and conditioner that the hairdressers told me to use, right? Luckily, I get a discount at, at the salon Centrix or the, the um, wholesaler, but I only use professional products on my hair because I color my hair. And that's the same with the skincare. I don't believe there's anything over the counter that I want them to use. I want them to use professional grade products with professional grade ingredients that's gonna support their skincare goals at home. Why do I want them to use that? The why is in the active ingredients. I want you to use the serum because it's got arbutin, mulberry, and beer berry that's gonna help brighten your skin. And you told me that your concern are those brown patches, that hyperpigmentation on your cheeks. So that's why I want you to use this Brighten Me product to be able to achieve your skincare goals. And that's it. That's me, that's Elaine Sterling. I hope you enjoyed this today. And we'll go ahead and um, chat to Josh. Sorry about the dog in between there, Josh. <laughs> That's okay. They, I had the same situation. I'm, thankfully, my microphone was off. I had my long guys next door at the neighbors, so I get it. Okay. They hear things that we don't hear. And usually I put them in the crate when I have these, but I forgot today because they were being quiet. All right. So let's go into some questions and answers. So let's see here. So Deborah asked an interesting question. She asked early on, she asked what your opinion of vaping on the skin was, or have you seen any studies about vaping and the effects of it on the skin? I have not. But again, if there is vape coming out, the vape, anything that is on the skin is gonna get on the, is gonna get into the skin. So I've not seen any studies, but I'm sure there is an effect on the skin because it's still a smoke of some kind that you're, you're vaping. Okay. Summer asks, after a chemical peel, how long should you wait before microdermabrasion? Okay, good question. It depends on the pH of the peel, and it also depends on the percentage of acid. So that's not a, that's not a one step answer. Now I can combine my chemical peels with my microdermabrasion. I like to do my peel first and then the microdermabrasion, that's just me. But I'll do a milder spa grade peel if they've had a medical grade peel, that means a pH lower than a three, there's probably going to be um, a wait time of six weeks. If they've had what I call a pH of three and just a mild a percentage acid, you could wait two weeks. So I hope I've answered your question. It depends on the pH and the percentage of acid. Got it. So this is an interesting one. Someone anonymous asked, what if someone is only oily on their eyelids? What causes it and how to fix it? I've never seen an oily eyelid because there isn't much sebaceous activity around the, below the orbital bone. So we've got the orbital bone and that's why we use eye cream because it's got a smaller molecule because there isn't enough sebaceous activity. So an oily eyelid, that I am, I'm, I'm not sure unless I see it. Hmm, Shanda says that she is, and I know I experienced that, but that's interesting to look into. Um, we will, we will, we don't, we say we don't always have the answers, but we right, will look always. them up. Uh, so someone asked, Alexis asked, would you still do a chemical peel to help with melasma that has been present for years after birth? Okay, so I would, melasma is tricky because you could make it worse. Mm. So I would start with tyrosinase inhibitors at home, and a mild, like a mandelic acid gel that we have or a lactic acid gel that you're using at home first. You're preparing the skin and you're also seeing what happens. I then would um, um, start with a very mild peel and see, because you don't want to make the melasma worse because that will make the client upset. So it's a little bit, remember what I said, it's one foot on the gas, one foot on the brake. You're gonna start them with home care that has brightness, tyrosinase inhibitors, and an AHA gel. Then start them on mild peels, and then your red LED and other thing, oxygen things that you have in your treatment room, and then see what the melasma does before you go to more aggressive or deeper peels. Okay. 
Uh, Kaylee asks, what do you think of dermal infusions for treating PIH or PIE? D which, which, what type of dermal infusion? She's going to have to give me, some, she'll have to give, send me some more information. Yeah, she's, um, she's fine. And then, um, then I can answer. Sounds good. And how she's doing those dermal infusions. And then she, Anonymous asks, I know the answer, but I can, I can answer if you'd like, but I think this is something that I actually get a lot in product knowledge. And I, I, but anyways, I'll say, can you mix your SPF with your moisturizer is the question. Okay, so it's a twofold answer. I don't. And the reason why I don't is that um, our moisturizers have peptides in. So I want the SPF to stay on the surface of the skin. I really don't want the SPF to go into the skin, if that makes sense. Right. What were you going to say, Josh? I was going to say the same thing. You, layering is important. Mixing them together basically dilutes the effectiveness of both products. You always want to make sure that the moisturizer is doing its job. Whatever the active ingredients of the moisturizer are, if there are any, you want to make sure that they're being absorbed easily into the skin, quickly into the skin, and then protecting that moisturized skin. I feel like if you mix them together, you, again, dilute the effectiveness of both the products you're mixing. Right, and I'm not sure, you know, because we have got peptides in our skin, I can't talk about our products. Um, um, I don't want to drive, you know, the, um, well, it, the peptides that we have to, because, you know, water-soluble substances can't penetrate the skin. So we have certain peptides to help as delivery systems. So I don't really want to deliver certain, certain um, SPFs into the skin. All right, let's see. So Sophie asks, and this is a broad question, but hopefully Sophie didn't, she may have missed our acne presentation, but she asks, what treatments and products should be avoided on someone with acne medication, oral and or topical? Say that again. So she asks, what treatments and products should be avoided with someone who is on acne medications, either oral or topical? Well, it depends on which ones. I'm not sure that, that yeah, again, kind of if, it's, if, it's an, if it's an antibiotic, their skin may be light sensitive. If it's Accutane, we can't do a service. They have to be offered for six months to a year. Um, I mean, if, if it's retinol, we definitely don't want to do like a peel or anything. If it's Retin-A, I want them to be offered for seven days before right. a peel. So, you know, again, it depends on which ones they're on. Kendall asks, what is the best treatment for skin scarring? Uh, kind of another broad question, but I feel like there might be some answers there. Yeah, of course, it depends on the Fitzpatrick. We've got microdermabrasion, we've got plasma lift, we've got um, laser, we've got... Uh, microneedling? Uh, microneedling. Oh, microneedling is fabulous. Thank you. So again, it, 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 you know, you, you cannot cookie cutter these treatments. You've got to devise a plan for each client differently. Even though it says acne treatment on the menu, that doesn't mean one acne treatment fits all. So Shamima asks less, more of a, I guess, ethical question, if you will. She asks, do you think it's wrong to charge for consultations before offering a facial treatment? I offer a complimentary one. I don't charge for skincare consultations, but every area and demographic is different. I feel spending 15 minutes with my clients on a skincare consultation which may end up being a lifetime client um, in the treatment room, as well as somebody that would possibly purchase product to support their skin is well worth my 15 minutes. You know, so um, it, it depends on your area. I, if you have people coming in all the time and you're spending all day, um, you know, doing free skin analysis and, but I've never had that happen. Like I said, in my history, I've been an esthetician for 30 years, believe it or not. And, um, I've never charged for a skin analysis. And then I think we have one more time for one more question from Summer and she asks, um, some of the best products to slow down the aging process and when should you start these preventative measures? Well, again, we go back to the subject matter of when do you st first start seeing signs of aging? Okay, and we know in our teens and our early twenties, it's probably maintenance. Or what is our favorite word now that we like to use? Do you remember the word? Oh, you're asking me a toughie. Uh, okay, um, I'll think of it, but um, it's definitely maintenance. Okay, so um, when you start seeing skin laxity, fine lines and wrinkles, um, perhaps hormonal fluctuations in the skin, um, definitely, it, it depends. Are you, are you not aging and it's hyperpigmentation? Are you aging and it's skin laxity? Then it's definitely 
the, the products with the peptides and the hyaluronic acid and things like that. I just thank you. I love you all. I'm excited that we're getting back to working in the spa safely. And I applaud all of you for your hard work, for staying home, for social distancing, and for really working hard on your knowledge and gaining knowledge during this time. We're going to be back stronger and safer. And let your clients know of all the trainings you've attended, everything that you've done to keep them safe and to learn um, new methods, etc. during this time. I'm very proud of you. I love you all. I always say, no matter if you went to my school or not, you're still my student. I'm the mother of all estheticians, I like to say. So um, I, it warms my heart that I'm able to connect with estheticians all around the world, all around the globe, because we're truly, truly in this together. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Love you. Thank Bye. You. Love you. Bye.